So, um, would you say that the uh, the megalithic yard then is a uh, is a valid system of judgment? Uh, no, it's not at all. No, no. All the systems of the ancient world. I mean, I mean, we call things like Roman feet, Greek feet, Assyrian feet, uh, Persepolitan feet. There's Chinese, Japanese, Aztec. You know, but it's all one system, and uh, you know they're the foot lengths come between certain strictures, you know, it's very, very well organised. And the megalithic yard um, is a bone of contention. It's a thing that just won't lay down and die, you know. But there is um, a le legitimate measure close to the megalithic yard. But you never find the megalithic yard used in rational numbers in any megalithic circle. So I don't quite know how Tom got to it. But um, present... Uh, uh, research by a, a really good guy in the field, um, Howard Crowhurst, would imply that the megalithic yard was used in the in the layout geometry, but it's not visible as a as a unit. You know, um, you would start me with that one, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> now, this is the uh, the biggest bone of contention in metrology: the existence or not of the megalithic yard. But I don't think it's there. Fair enough. I, I mean, I. I, I was chatting with Adam Butler last year, who's done work um, on, his, on his late book, particularly with Thornborough Henge, um, mm. looking, and this surprised me personally, looking at um, the ancient origins of the metric system, which uh, I was completely unaware of, and uh, like most people thought it originated with Napoleon. Um, what's, what's your view on that? Uh, God, you, you pick out all the choice ones for the beginning, don't you? Um, look at what the meter is. I mean, this is how you do it. <coughs> if you look at a metre, it's one ten millionth of the equator to the pole. Mm -hmm. So in every degree on the Earth's surface, there'd be 111,000.111111, you know, uh, metres to a degree. So it's 111111.111111. Well, if you take as the measurement of a degree, the traditional measurement, which is 360,000 feet. Now, this would be a geographic foot, of course, but just take the number 360,000. Mm. And if you divide 111111 by 360, um, you can see it comes to 1.08, and this is um, a Belgic foot. So yes, the metre would have been known in antiquity. It would have been three Belgic feet. But what you've done is you've averaged all the degrees to arrive at the modern value of the metre. And this is not how the ancients worked. You know, they, they would take the various degrees and then the, the foot measures would vary according to the degree. Um, and there are deliberate variations in measurements. And uh, if, if you average them, you destroy the integrity of all of them. You know, so the metre's taken from, well, it ought to be around 45 degrees, you know. Uh, there is no ancient measurement that is legitimately a metre unless it's three Belgic feet. You get Sumerian feet come very close to it and you get all these theories about things coming close to it. But you've got to look at what the metre actually is. And it's 111, 111.111111 to the degree. And that defines the metre. And does that speak to um, a particular point in history? Because some would have us believe that the Earth is actually in a state of constant expansion. So would that not? Affect? No, it's not. No. <coughs> um, let's say that the, the oblate spheroid yes. is caused by the diurnal revolution of the Earth, yeah? Yes. In, um, in very ancient times, you know, I'm not quite sure when, but, but geologic eons ago, when the first corals were being formed, they know from slicing up the first corals that the actual day, the actual number of years, uh, days in a year, was... Um, around 400 days in the year, so it had a much faster spin at that time. Uh -huh. Therefore, the, the, the um, poles would have been rather more diminished than they are now. But like within, you know, the last millions of years, a few millions of years, it's been pretty stable where it is, you know, so uh, it, it's not growing, it's not shrinking, no. So as, as, the, as the, uh, the rotational rate reduces, the, the crushing effect of, of inertia uh, of centrifugal is reduced. No, if, so if, if, if the rate of, of revolution um, uh, slowed, then, then, then the poles would get longer, so it would more, more approach a perfect sphere. Yeah. 
now see. Interesting. Um, uh, what we've come to know as the imperial system, feet and inches, yeah. were traditionally, at least, said to be based on the measurements of the human body, a, a man's thigh, they all are. a man's hand. They all are. Yeah. yeah. Do you think it's significant then that, in as much as some <coughs> of this has changed, as you say, between Sumerian, Greek, Egyptian, uh, and the different sizes no, of no, human? No, but man hasn't changed. Okay. Not in the slightest. Yeah. Over um, thousands of years or millions? Or? Um, probably in a couple of million years. Yeah. You talk to Cremo and it'll probably be like 43 million I years. Was go, uh, I was just going to go on to that, go. actually. Yeah, yeah. No, I, yeah. I had the great pleasure of speaking to him earlier on today and yeah. I'm agreeing hugely with most of them, if yeah. indeed all of what he says. No, no, um, men vary in size, of course they do, yeah. and um, they vary in stature between, say, a canonical man can be five feet four tall, mm. and that would mean he's six feet of the what we call the Assyrian foot, which is 0.9 feet. Now, the, the longest foot that can be called a mathematical foot is the Russian foot. It's also one of the old sacred Jewish feet, but it's it's seven to six of the English foot. So the, the, the tallest man, canonical man, would be seven feet, and the shortest man would be five feet four. And all the different feet from all over the world, they all fit together to form a unified system. But that would be the length of the fathom between, f say, five feet six and seven feet. And it's a strange thing that the British Merchant Navy took as their fathom between five feet, six and seven feet. So since prehistory, it's carried right on. So wherever the, the British uh, Merchant Navy were, they'd have to, they'd make damn sure they got from the harbour master what he was talking about when he meant a fathom. Otherwise, they'd run aground. Yeah, yeah important distinction to make, I should think. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, <coughs> well, we're here under the auspices of megalithomania once more yeah. in... Uh, Hallowed Glastonbury, yeah. the Isle of Avalon. Um, the, the, the tagline for Megalithomania is, what were the ancients up to? Yeah. Um, and that has become a bit of a catch-all for most of the things that draw people here and indeed the things that we are we find fascinating mm. and uh, come here to learn about and talk about. Um, what were the ancients up to? Why, why is there such a correlation? Um, well, it's pretty obvious really what they were up to. They were managing their environment it all went on for thousands and thousands of years without any problems at all, you know. And this is like, uh, and what well, it was filtered down to us from, from the ancient society is, is things like fertility rituals, you know, and uh, and observations of, of times of year and things like that. Um, that they were simply managing the environment. They were working in harmony instead of against it. And, and they, knew, they knew it was their job. They knew their lives depended on looking after the environment. That's what the ancients were up to. And they were bloody damn smart. Far, far smarter than, yeah. than perhaps we've hitherto given them credit yeah. for as well. Um, so when we look all over the world at the various sites, we look at obviously in our own British Isles at uh, places like Avery and Stonehenge, um, and then we look to the Americas, um, sort of the uh, the Mundo Maya in Central America, the Aztec and Inca in South America, Egypt, China. Uh, why are there such commonalities in terms of the structures, the astronomical alignments, um, the well, methods. yes, yes, I mean, th this is one of the first things that, I mean, John Michel was the first man to broach this this whole cult culture, mm. you know, um, and um, he, he said that there's relics of, 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 a, of a high culture that existed throughout the world, mm. and, and that's exactly what it is, mm. you know, it's a culture that existed throughout the world. Man was aware of the size of the earth, he was also aware of a, uh, the, the inhabitants of it and the distances between them. And he was a perfectly good navigator. He needed a measurement system to navigate. So, you know, he needed a measurement system for everything he did. Yeah. And to, to, just to talk about the moon, how did you and, and you actually, you two, how did you crack the metrology code? Um, through bloody hard work, really. Um, coming to a lot of wrong conclusions about things and um, trying to build our own, you know, I can see people doing it now, you know, building their own little cosmologies, you know, out of these constant numbers and things. And uh, um, John and me, it was, I don't know, it wasn't rivalry, it was cooperation, but um, we were both striving after the same thing for many, many years. But the thing is, even if you're making mistakes and going the wrong way, at least you're qualified to understand the truth when you see it. Mm -hmm. And then you can abandon all your all your wrong theories, even if it's taken years to put it together. You can shit candle a lot, you know, and uh, get on with the truth. Then. Mm. 
if you recognise it. Hard thing to do, to let go of that much work? Um, it's, it's not really, it's the obvious thing to do, isn't it? You just kiss it off because you're so glad to find the truth that, that you're quite willing to uh, uh, say well, I was wrong. Yeah. And how would you say your, uh, your work was, was received by um, the edifices of academia? Oh, with um, huge uh, confusion and puzzlement and uh, lack of understanding, you know. Obviously, I mean, if you're going to get into my work, you've got to, you've got to work at it, you know. It's not going to jump out of, the, out of the page at you, you know. You've got to be interested. Well, but it's, you know, it's my job to try and make you interested, so, so uh, you know. And what, what do you suppose is at the root of the intransigence of, of, of mainstream academia, uh, mainstream archaeology, when faced with new discoveries, and which, which do... Um, well, the, the worst thing about it is it's got to be peer-reviewed. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> who can peer-review a pioneer? No one's been there. <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> there, there, there are just no, no experts in, in my field at all. Beautiful None. input. Yeah. yeah, no, quite so. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and it's something I touch on with, with everybody that I speak about is that, that when you are faced with a situation where um, it is in the vested interest of, of an academic body not to change, and indeed accolade yeah. upon accolade is heaped mm -hmm. upon you, provided you don't, you know, mm -hmm. you don't say the emperor has no clothes. Yes, quite. Yeah. It does kind of hamstring yeah. you from the get go. Well, lots of archaeologists have had their careers ruined by being too outspoken. Mm. You know, the reactionary ones among the archaeological establishment seem to twat down the young sort of right ones. <laughs> yeah. So still room for the gifted amateurs then? <coughs> that's what that's about it. Yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah. So, do you think, looking, looking at these sites, I mean, apart from the obvious, you know, I say obvious, apart from the, the messages that get sent to us in terms of the metrology, uh, the archaeo astronomy. Is there something more that we can look for from these sites? Is there something intrinsic that speaks to the, perhaps the spiritual ca aspect of man? Um, I don't know. I, I, I really don't feel qualified to answer that. Um, I, I do know that um, uh, whatever mankind is constructing himself, it, it, it'll only be comfortable if the harmonies are built into it, you know, mm. which is, you know, what you might term feng shui, isn't it? You know. Mm -hmm. If you put your house in the right place, facing the right direction, of course it's going to be a good vibe. I and mean, if you, you know, build a tower block and you live in a basement there, you know, or something, of course you're going to not feel very harmonious, you know. But it's, um, yes, so, so sighting is quite important to get the right admixtures of forces. You know. So would you say that that kind of, what we're talking about feng shui about, uh, perhaps more, Precisely called Earth mysteries or Earth energies, rather. Um, would you say that that's that's something that we can look more closely at, perhaps recording? I mean, obviously there are those, uh, you know, gifted among us who who can um, yeah, down mu hear music. Exactly. Yeah, I've got a tin ear, you know. And I, I know that uh, the thing that most resembles my study is music. Interesting. And yet I can't hear the music, you know, but I can see the numbers. Mm. Interesting, because yeah, yeah, I'm probably the other way around. I do, yeah. I don't, numbers are a bit of anathema to me, but yeah, but, yeah the music kind of works for me. Well, music's all riddled with numbers. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, yeah. of course, yeah. and you know, harmony too, yeah. Fibonacci and all that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. interesting. Um, so why do we think that the archaeologists continue to claim that these sites are, are not as old as now appears to be the case? With each year, it seems we're pushing back these construction dates further and further. Um. Well, whatever I say about that's going to be conjecture and my own beliefs, isn't it? Nothing I mean, it, it's a mystery. Yeah. I, I mean, it's a mystery how the whole thing, and whence it arose, how it arose, because the thing about the measurement systems and indeed the, the, the ancient systems of building and things come into existence complete, ready to go, you know, fully developed. There's no evolutionary sort of build up to them. They tried to say, with the pyramid builders first, they built Mastabas and then they went on and they go, but it's not like that at all. You know, the best is the first, you know. Absolutely. And it's yeah. deterioration after that. Which of course, you know, it's right. So it's a, a mystery and I'd, yeah. be, I'd be conjecturing whatever I say about that. <laughs> okay, so have you been able to apply the, the, the discoveries that you've made in metrology to, um, have you looked at 
Have you looked at other sites, say, for instance, um, in Mesoamerica, uh, in Egypt? No, I, I've only got other people's um, dimensions to work from, so I make, make absolutely sure that um, the people I'm consulting are proper. Mm -hmm. you, know, I, you know, as long as my, my data's correct. Mm -hmm. No, I don't go fretting around much myself. Although I do go to, uh, I did go down to Turin recently and measure up their collection of Royal Egyptian cubit rods. Okay. And it was a very, very enlightening uh, experience, and there were wonderful things to actually hold, you know. Wow. You know, because I've sort of uh, um, got a certain reverence for them and, uh, yeah. and, and, and the people who use them. I mean, the, 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 they come from tombs. Now, the only people who had a tomb were, the, were nobility and royalty, mm -hmm. and, and all the measure, measurers and uh, um, the architects, scribes, um, astronomers, they, they were all picked from, from nobility, you see. Mm. And, and, and then the, they, they were highly revered within society. That's why they had a tomb. Yeah. To find so many cubit rods in tombs it makes you think that these guys were, you know, highly advanced in one science or another. The keepers of the sacred knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Your cubit was a very sacred object, yeah. Mm. Mm. And what, yeah. can I ask, what you, what you did discover in, in examining these rods at Turin? Um, I, I discovered that uh, my theories as to the variations of the cubits was correct, right <laughs> down to the fine detail. Fabulous. Uh, can, I, can I explain that? You Please, know, yeah, I, know I you wish you would. Numbers. <coughs> There's one particular rod, I mean, Richard Lepsius measured it in 1865, but it's a square bronze rod, and it's not actually a rod just from cubit, it's, it's one of the measures almost the same length, but it is, in fact, variance of the nipper foot. Well, the length of this cubit um, uh, it's got four sides, it's bronze, hieroglyphs on one side and three different scales on the other three sides. But one of these scales is divided up into 27 parts, all very beautifully done, you know, like a, it's been made like an engineer would have made it, you know, it's an absolutely exquisite uh, device. It's divided up into 27 parts. Well, there are 16 digits in a foot. So you take 27 divided by 16, it comes to 1.6875 feet. Yeah. And that's the exact length of that side of that rod in English feet. 27 divided 16, 1.6875. Brilliant. Wow. Yes. Wow. Wow. That's the same. And I've, I've maintained through my studies that. Um, the measurement system is largely based upon the English foot, or the English foot is pivotal to the whole arrangement, you know. Which, of course, makes it much older than everybody thinks it is. Of course, it, it, it's, it's, they're all as old as each other because yeah. it's a single system used universally. And the English foot is one, of the, the, is one of the variations of the Greek feet, you see. So it's actually a Greek foot. Yeah. And Nipper, we're talking about Babylon. <coughs> we're talking about Babylon, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, the Nipper cubit, uh, it was given to us by archaeologists who, who got the divisions of a copper bar that was dredged out of the Euphrates wow. and it's 2,600 years old and uh, but the length I call you know it's known as the nipper L so it's the nipper cubit and that's the exact length um, is one of those lengths on this bronze rod that comes from an Egyptian tomb okay. well, I mean so, so it's a universal system and uh, where is that now it's in the um, Museo Agazio in uh, Torino, the wow. Egyptian Museum, to it. I shall have to go over there, don't I? Uh, we, I? Yeah, I went over there, I spent a, a, a really blissful afternoon measuring these things. <laughs> yeah. Fabulous. And, uh, it, 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 uh, it fit very well with the general theory. Not very well, fabulously well. Yeah. Excellent. Well, we are at last um, in the inexorable year of 2012. It's, it's been a long time coming. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and oh, now look, <laughs> now look. <laughs> I assure you that um, once December the 23rd comes and goes without incident, there's no need to stop being paranoid <laughs> because Newton predicted the end of the world for 2060. Oh, did he? Yes. Excellent. And I'd rather believe a good, upstanding Englishman like Newton than a wet back mayor. <laughs> we can always rely on a good cataclysm. If, you th if the current one don't get you, there'll be another one along in a minute. Way, exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I was, I, I was going to ask what you would uh, hope for for 2013 or beyond, but I think you've pretty much answered that for me. Yeah, right. <laughs> John Neal, thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure. Thank you.